welcome once again into the Radiopedia Reading Room, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or tassiography. This is a radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, uh uh-oh, there's trouble brewing in the courtroom. Or more correctly, there's double trouble because I'm joined by two people this episode. It's my co-host, Frank Gaylard, and friend of the podcast, neuroradiologist, radiopedia editor, it's Francis Deng. Happy to be here, Andrew. Well, this is very exciting because it sounds like an awesome opportunity for me to do even less work than normal. (laughs) Even less. (laughs) Now, I've caught up with Gaylard in 2024, but I haven't caught up with you, Francis. How was your Christmas and New Year period? Oh, it was pretty low key. I went back to Northern Virginia where I grew up, just about an hour and a half away from Baltimore. I caught up with some friends and family. Actually, on Christmas Eve, a group of friends and I uh, from high school did an escape room. And ah. listeners may remember from a prior episode with Imran Lasker, we did on uh, AO spine subaxial injury classification that right before the holiday break. He said, doing the escape room one year at the RCNA was one of the best things he ever experienced in his life. So I was, I was pretty excited to try this one that was closer to my house. You're not going to believe this. No one's going to believe this. But I reckon I've got documented evidence, but probably about six, seven years ago, I came up with the idea. I was like, we should do a Radiopedia escape room at like a major conference, like the big Australian <laughs> conference or RSNA. Never happened. It was like, yeah. that sounds like too much work. But I was like, that would be good. And apparently, if you go to the conference and there's an escape room, it is really good. <laughs> would you have radiology themed clues, of course? Yeah. Hide little Easter eggs around the website and guide them towards <laughs> those. That's going to be great. Oh, yeah, of course. That sounds great. One day. One day we will do it. One day. That reminds me, actually, after this podcast recording today, I'm going to a, not an escape room, but a virtual reality kind of warehouse where you go around shooting zombies. So I've done that one. That's, that's good fun. That's the one where you have the virtual reality backpack on, right? So you've got the headphones yeah. and the gun and you walk around a warehouse and they've got tilted floor and your vestibular system goes all a bit crazy because your brain's telling you that you're walking downhill but the floor is flat yeah, it's and then weird. they blow wind on you. and Yeah, you're going across like a little tightrope and they blow wind on you to simulate. It's like, yeah, it's terrifying, but yeah. fantastic. No, but my fun. son's only just got old enough. I think there's like oh, an age cut off. Is it 13, is it? Yeah, it must be 13. Oh, good. So he's coming along for the first time, so it's going to be good. But that's not what we're here to do. We're not here to talk about virtual reality and escape room. So this is a special episode, Frank, because uh, mm. Francis knows why he's here, but I've kind of kept you in the dark as nothing to new there topic. Dixon nothing new <laughs> <laughs> but you know like all good radiologists you probably thrive in the dark gala so I'm sure you'll do all right I don't know is this another one of your attempts at humiliating me publicly no, I never set out to humiliate or embarrass you, Gaylord. You do all that by yourself, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so, no, this isn't a quiz or anything okay. like that. Um, we're actually going to be looking through a recent malpractice court case from oh. the United States. Okay. So, the event actually occurred back in 2018, uh, somewhere in New York, I think. But the court ruling was announced just at the start of December. And Francis is here because he tweeted all about it. And in fact, he wrote two quite detailed threads and I saw them on Twitter and thought, or X, I should say, and I thought that sounds like an interesting podcast episode because that's all I think about these days. I'm like, oh, that's a good, that's good content. <laughs> <laughs> and it is radiology related, Frank. In fact, it's neuroradiology related. Ah. So right well, I've been living in my self-imposed social media blackout for a long time now, so I have completely missed this, but I am intrigued. You don't have an alert set on your phone for every time Francis Deng tweets? No, I've just got (laughs) meat-related alerts. (laughs) (laughs) Francis is disappointed. Um, So I'm actually going to attempt to read out your tweets, Francis. So I'm just going to do word for word. There's also, you included all these excerpts from the court documents. The names have been redacted from your tweets. But to make it easier for me to read out, I'm going to add a name back in. I'm actually going to call the patient Barry mainly because I had to come up with a name, but I've been watching that series, Barry. Have any of you watched that? Is that the serial killer? Yeah, yeah, um, serial killer who's going the to assassin. Like yeah, theater class. The assassin, yeah, theater class. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that was on my mind. So we're going to call the patient Barry. A few other names that appear uh, for the physicians involved here. So I'm going to say radiology resident one, radiology resident two, neurology resident. There's a telestroke neurologist as well as a neurointerventionalist, okay? So they're the names I'm going to use for the redacted names in these documents. And unlike Francis, who led his uh, Twitter thread by giving the outcome 
of the court case, I'm going to keep that a surprise, gay lad. Okay? okay, so it's a surprise for you and for the listeners, perhaps who haven't heard about it. So true podcast style here. All it's right. going to be a real mystery. Francis, anything you want to add before I start reading out your tweets? Yeah, I decided to divide the Twitter threads into digestible parts. The first part is uh, focused on the plaintiff or the patient's family's testimony, and so that's mm-hmm. their perspective. And the second part. I looked at all the statements from the physicians involved uh, and their expert witnesses. Awesome. Tweet one just introduced the topic, so I'm going to skip to tweet two. And Francis says, a 41-year-old man without significant past medical history is last seen well at 10 p.m. as his wife went to bed. Open brackets, he stayed up to play video games. Close brackets. I think we can relate to that. (laughs) (laughs) He's discovered unresponsive at 3 a.m. when his wife is awoken by a loud bang. So now I'll read a bit from the, the wife's testimony here. So you'll hear the, the lawyer and the wife going back and forth here. So question, after you had gone to bed on the 26th, when was the next time you saw your husband? Answer, approximately 3 a.m. I heard a loud bang. So I got out of bed and my son, who was on the third floor, heard it as well. And so we came to the bathroom. I shut the door before the son could see anything. And we saw Barry on the floor, naked, covered in vomit and shaking. Question, was it a loud bang that woke you up or were you already awake or something else? Answer, the bang woke me up. Question, was he making any noises at this time? Answer, he was snore breathing. Question, can you tell me if he was awake? Answer, he was completely unresponsive. Pupils were fully dilated. Question, the way he was shaking, was it small tremors or something more violent perhaps? Answer, it seemed like small tremors. So we'll move on to tweet three. So Francis says, he is brought in by emergency medical services to the emergency department of the region's only comprehensive stroke centre, arriving around 3.30 to 3.40 a.m. He is intubated for airway protection. So question, after you had gone into the waiting room after your husband was intubated, when was the next time you spoke to a medical professional? Answer, shortly after he was intubated. So this must have been somewhere around, I don't know, 3.45 to 4 a.m. They had moved him into another room, so they had came and got me in a side room next to, I guess, the emergency pit area. I don't know what it's all called. And he was intubated, still on IV. And then they, the female, I guess, neurologist, neuro team, came back into the room and they said that they didn't know what was wrong with him and talked to me about, or someone talked to me about, getting his spinal fluid tapped for infection and then getting him a CT or CAT scan or something next. And I don't know if they started him on antibiotics at that point or what, but it was kind of a blur medically for those things. Question, do you recall if he had his spinal fluid tapped after that? Answer, they said they did and later on told me it came back negative for infection. Question, do you know if he got a CT scan after that? Answer, yes. I just want to point out this order of events was questioned by some folks on Twitter and uh, the actual order of events, according to the medical record, was the spinal tap was after the CT, which makes a lot more sense, medically speaking. And this testimony was corrected during the trial when uh, the defense team was cross-examining the patient's wife. I think, understandably, it's really hard to expect people to recall the exact order of medical events, especially if they're not a physician, several years after the events occurred, Mm. especially if they didn't have a chance to review all the medical records to prepare for the deposition. Can I ask, Francis, just on that, the event took place in 2018 and the judgment came down in December 2023, you said? Yep. Yep. So mm-hmm. how how many years after the event was this testimony given? The lawsuit was filed in 2020 and a lot of paperwork was exchanged. I don't recall when this deposition was actually given, but it was probably around 21 or 22. I find uh, I find it bizarre that people can give testimony to the sequence of events for something that happened four years ago. Even something as traumatic and memorable as this, just uh, it's weird that we even ask the questions, really. Mm-hmm. Anyway. I'm not surprised that there's, you know, being muddled up in terms of the order that things occur. But I think that's one of the interesting things about this is that what's actually going to be presented at court is what the patient or the patient's family heard or recalls from the time. It's not necessarily entirely what's written in the medical notes and documented at the time. It's also their reflections upon it, which may have changed a lot over time as well. Absolutely. So that's something to be aware of. 
Uh, tweet number four, a CT slash CTA is performed soon thereafter and no abnormality was initially identified. Question, did you come to find out the results of the CT scan? Answer, they came to speak to me at around, I guess, 4.15 or 4.30 and said they didn't see anything on the CT or CAT scan. They didn't know what was wrong with him. That was it. Question, so between the time that he was intubated and when he had the CT scan, had you noticed any changes in his condition? Answer, no. Question, after he was intubated, could you describe for me more what physically you saw when you saw your husband? You said there was IVs, if he was lying in bed, was he able to get out of bed, was he responding, anything of that nature? Answer, he was non-responsive. He was lying in bed, his eyes were closed, intubated, that was it. Question, what happened next after you found out the CT scan results? Answer, we just waited. So tweet five, Francis says, about 7 to 8 a.m., the wife receives notice that they are urgently taking the patient to surgery. Question, what do you recall next after the family arriving? Answer, Barry just laying there in the same state with no answers from anyone there until around 7 to 7.30 a.m., maybe a little bit later, I got a phone call because they had sent us, they were taking Barry somewhere. So they called me that Barry was going into surgery and they were rushing him down the hall and the woman said that he needed to get into surgery right away and insisted, told me I should give him a kiss and say goodbye in case he didn't wake up. And then they wheeled him into surgery. This must have been around 8 a.m. or so. Question, do you know if this woman was a doctor or a nurse or anything else? Answer, she was a doctor. I believe she was on the surgical team that was putting Barry under surgery. Apparently she said that the team had just been informed that morning of Barry. So tweet number six. The day team had made the diagnosis of basilar artery occlusion. Thrombectomy was performed. If you assume the loud bang was the time of symptom onset, then this intervention was within six hours. Question, what was the next time that you saw your husband after the surgery? Answer, I spoke with Dr. Neurointerventionalist after the surgery, must have been approximately 8.30 to 8.45 a.m., and he showed me a picture of the blood clot that they had extracted. He told me that the team in the morning saw the clot on the CT scan right away, which is why they rushed Barry into surgery. He had told me that the clot was white, which means it was recently formed, had not been there very long, and that because he was so young, they were able to extract it very quickly, young and in a good health. Question. You said he referred to a team in the morning. Do you know what team that was? Answer. I guess there was a team that arrived at around 7 a.m. to 7.30 a.m., a different team than the night team, the surgical team or something neurosurgical. I don't know. Surgical teams would probably arrive about 7 a.m. in Australia. The rest of the teams yes. probably not that early. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tweet number seven. The neurointerventionalist intimated to the patient's wife that he could see the clot on the scan from the door. Question. Do you recall anything else about this conversation with Dr. Neurointerventionalist that we haven't already spoken about? Answer, just that he indicated he was able to clearly see the clot on the scans as soon as he walked in the door. Hmm. Tweet 8. This neurointerventionalist soon discloses that a medical error occurred, resulting in delay in diagnosis, but omits explanation of the potential effects. He placed blame on the radiologist and indicates a reprimand was given. The wife is upset. Question, so tell me about this discussion with Dr. Neurointerventionalist. For starters, when was it? It was sometime while Barry was at redacted name of hospital. So it would have been between November 28th and early December when he communicated to me that he was not consulted when Barry was brought into admission and that the radiologist had misidentified and not seen the clot on the scan and that he should have been called right away and he wasn't and that as soon as his team got in in the morning, they easily identified the clot, which is why they rushed him into surgery, and that they had reprimanded the team prior for not identifying the clot, and he was extremely upset with them, something like that. Question, did he describe any kind of effect that this delay could have caused? Answer, no. Question, do you recall what you said? Answer, I asked him why they hadn't seen it earlier. Question, do you recall if he said anything in response to that answer? He couldn't give an explanation. Tweet nine. So we're coming to the end here. The patient regained consciousness, but
but had disabling neurological deficits related to speech, memory, sight, lethargy. A diagnosis of catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome was made and more prognostic information is shared. He needs 24-7 care. That's it for the family's testimony thread. So Francis, tweet 10, you just uh, kind of told readers to stay tuned for part two, which is the physicians and expert witness testimony. Uh, But Frank, what do you think so far, first time you're hearing this? It's harrowing on so many levels, isn't it? Firstly, that first line in one of the early tweets where the wife shuts the door to the bathroom so that the son can't see Mm. the husband just really brought home to me just how, you know, this is such a tragedy for this family. And then to come into hospital and anyone who's dealt with healthcare as a patient or a family member knows that even good hospitals, even the ones with everyone that's caring and trying to do the right thing, it's so hard to know what's going on. Even as a medical professional, you know, as a patient, you don't know what's going on. And the sense of bewilderment and impotence that the wife is feeling during those first hours, you can really feel it. And it sets the stage for you know, the feeling then that things were missed and that things were done badly because of that lack of communication. But at the same time, you know, communication is great. But when you use words like, I could see it from across the room as soon as I walked in the door, that Mm -hmm. doesn't help really, even if it's true. It it really throws the radiologist under the bus, whether whether it's an obvious finding or not. But I don't know. You've had more time to think about this than me, Francis. What do you think about that choice of words? I mean, it's certainly a really unfortunate situation for the patient and their family. And it's also unfortunate that an error occurred. There's been a movement in the patient safety field to recommend disclosure of medical error when it occurs because patients and their family deserve to know and it contributes to a general culture of safety at an institution, examining errors and disclosing them. And uh, contrary to some people's fears, uh, a systematic practice of disclosing errors to patients actually doesn't increase the rate of malpractice claims. But there's a right way and a wrong way to disclose an error. And it's not clear to me that this neurointerventionalist did it the right way, at least not by the way the patient's wife made it sound. And that's for a couple of reasons. I think most medical errors happen because a, a number of systems failures occurred, right? It's not just one person. There's something called the Swiss cheese model of accidents where you have a bunch of slices of cheese that have holes in them. And it's only when all the slices line up just right that you can see from one side of the stack to the other, meaning an error occurred despite all the usual protections and layers of checks. So it's unfair to throw one person under the bus in most cases of medical error. And certainly at this kind of early stage of the case, before you do some really heavy duty investigating, like a root cause analysis to determine all the factors that may have contributed. And that's the difference between a just culture and a blame culture. Yeah, A real proper disclosure done right should not only include that an error occurred, but also an explanation of the implications of harm, right? You know, this basal artery occlusion was not detected, and this is what it means for your husband. And it may be unclear at the time, uh, but it's important to know that uncertainty so the patient and their family doesn't jump to their own conclusions of causality. And even if there was causality, it's important to share what steps you're taking to try to minimize this harm or to prevent a similar error from occurring in the future. Patients really want to know these kinds of things that it's not just a a who is there to blame. They want to know that something like this won't happen in the future to someone else like them. I find it really difficult with open disclosure. It's kind of treated like it's a single event in time, like an error occurs and then you work out, right, okay, we need to go through an open disclosure process. But in reality, the best time for that might be several days later once all the the facts and and everything that's occurred lines up. But in the moment, that's when the the family member or the patient is looking Mm. for the information. That's when they actually first twig to the issue that there may have been an error. It's not a clean process, the open disclosure. That's one thing I find tricky. You know, if the if the patient's family were a thousand kilometers away, they don't know anything about it, and then you're talking to them five days later, that would be a nice, clean, open disclosure. You might have all the facts together. But when they're there, when they're part of it at the time, 
I, I think it's really, really, really difficult, isn't it? But those yeah, word choices from the, the wife's testimony about being able to visualise the abnormality as soon as they work, walk through the door, there's not a lot of good that can come from saying things like that in those moments. No, I think that's right. And it's um, obviously we're only going on the recollections of someone and we don't have a transcript of what was said or how it was said and there could be a lot of nuance. But the way that it sounds, it, it almost feels like the neurointerventionist is giving themselves a pat on the back for having seen it so easily. And, you know, I should have been called, I would have saved the day. If only this one thing would have occurred, everything would have been fine. Mm. And I've been involved in a, in a number of medical legal cases. In fact, on, on both sides, on one occasion, I was on the uh, receiving end. And that temptation to say, I would have definitely seen it is such a simplification of what actually occurs and i'm sure we'll talk about this later on but just because you see something immediately through the door which he may or she may well have done doesn't mean that you see it every time mm. uh, but mm. it reinforces that idea of this was a really easy thing to see and the fact that it was missed is a really big error and we need to find someone to blame and it forgets entirely why you were walking through that door. You were walking yeah. through that door because you've been called and said someone's got a basal of thrombosis, mm, right? Yeah. Of course you're going to spot it. Should we move on to part two and start Let's. to get some of the physician's testimony as well as the expert witnesses and the verdict as well? So tweet one, Francis just uh, introduces it again. So we'll start with tweet two. Non-contrast head CT was performed at 4.08 a.m. The reason for the study... R slash O bleed. So rule out bleed is all that's given. Wet read given to the neurology resident at 4.15 a.m. So seven minutes later, no acute intracranial hemorrhage. The brief preliminary report on the EMR at 4.33 a.m. reads, CT head, no acute intracranial hemorrhage, mass effect or shift of midline structures, no hydrocephalus, prominent magna, cisterna magna versus arachnoid cyst, no depressed calvarial fracture, mucosal thickening of the maxillary sinuses correlate for sinusitis, overlying support tubes. So based on what we heard from the wife about the patient's presentation, rule out bleed as the reason for the study seems inadequate here, right? Yeah, bad histories really get my goat. Every soapbox I get with medical students or residents from a referring specialty, I try to tell them to take best care of your patients give your radiologist a helpful indication that includes a one-liner history and what you're concerned for. So in this case, you could say last known normal 10 PM found after a fall in the bathroom, unconscious and covered in vomit. My concern is for intracranial hemorrhage or posterior circulation stroke. Yeah. I actually had a situation I was interpreting you know, trauma CTs on the weekend and I've seen so many CTs for, for minor little traumas and there's a massive list. So I've reported a CT and then the trauma doctors walk in and they go, oh, can we have a look at this patient? And as soon as they said it, I was like, oh, what was the, what was the mechanism for them? And they described this horrific mechanism of injury, right? And you're kind of like, well, I would have looked at the scan a little bit differently mm. potentially if I was given, mm. a, given the volume of scans I've got to look through. And so I said, look, I wouldn't look, I wouldn't be surprised if there's something I've missed here. Let's have a look through it with the fresh eyes. There was nothing on it, so it was still fine. But the history that they gave to me verbally in the room and the fact that there's five or six people walking into my room to hear about this case versus what's written on the request information, it's totally different, right? And it really frames, we talked about framing bias recently, really frames how you're going to approach the case. All right, tweet number three. So CTA head and neck was performed at 425. Reason for study, altered mental status. The RAD opened the study at 4.39 a.m. A brief preliminary report in the EMR at 4.45 reads no proximal occlusion or high-grade stenosis of the circular willis vessels. They say more than that, so they say no evidence of large aneurysm or large arterial venous malformation. However, aneurysms less than three millimeters may or may not be visualized utilizing CT angiographic techniques and specifically say the basilar artery is patent. The fact that they've said the basilar artery is patent makes me think that they were actually thinking there could be a basilar thrombosis and to, to look for it in this case, because it's not something I would specifically mention in a report otherwise. Right. Tweet four, 
The Rad resident says she decided to review the images again. She found some irregularity in the basilar artery tip and near 7am showed the case to their senior resident starting the day shift who would dictate the full preliminary report. 7am for a day shift sounds like early. Our registrars get in about 8.30. <laughs> yes. Actually, a large part of the transcript here was this uh, resident who was getting sued describing how her senior resident came in very early yeah. and, uh, and and that was explaining the, the timeline uh, a little bit better to the plaintiff lawyer. So here's a bit of testimony. Answer, I kept reviewing the case because I got more history and then I kept reviewing it. By the time I thought there was some irregularity in the basilar artery, Rad Resident 2 was already in. Tweet 5, they thought it could be a normal variant, hyperplasia due to fetal PCAs, thought about the case some more and ultimately decided to call attention to it as potentially pathological. Question, did Rad Resident 2 tell you, there it is, you missed it? Answer, no. Question, what did Rad Resident 2 tell you? Answer, we reviewed the case, thought it could be a normal variant, continued thinking through the case, and ultimately agreed that there is irregularity at the tip of question. Sure, when you found out from the fourth year resident that in fact there was this abnormality at the basilar tip, did you view that as an emergency? Answer, so I viewed that as something I wanted to call the team about. A bit of bit of lawyer trapping the <laughs> trapping the witness on that, on that one. Yeah. Tweet number six. Both the junior and the senior residents paged and called to get a hold of the treating team. Question. Tell me all the steps you took to notify neurology interventional radiology about this when you noticed it sometime around 6am to 6.45 range. Answer. So I paged them. I called them. Radiology resident two also paged and called them. I also had to, there were other ED studies that were going on, so I let Rad Resident 2 know, and I actually had to look at some of the other ED studies. This is the reality of actually reporting right, cases. trying to do 12 things at the same yeah. time. Yeah, and unfortunately, although it, while it's a reality, it's not a really good defense when you're up against a plaintiff lawyer because no. the lawyer will just say, so you're saying you couldn't take the due diligence on this case because you were yeah. busy with other things. Yeah. Part of the transcript I didn't show was uh, the lawyer was interested in how long it usually takes this resident to review such a case. They ended up not playing it up, but I, I have heard of other cases where they actually interrogate the metadata from your PACs to see how many minutes you spent on the case. And they've used oh. that against them in court saying, you only oh. spent three minutes on this non contrast head CT. And, so, and that's why you missed this uh, subdural hemorrhage or something. Yeah, but for a non-contrast head CT that says rule out bleed, you could do that within 20 seconds, right, in terms right. of that specific task. Well, and, and the other question is, of course, you could spend an hour on each study, but then how many would you not read? Right. Yeah. And then the other miss, because you didn't get to the next study for another hour, the defense would not be, well, I was doing a really good job on the first game. <laughs> it would be like, why was there a one-hour delay? Exactly. You can't win is what no. you're saying. Uh, yeah. Tweet seven, about this gap in time, the resident testified that it was a tough case that required some consideration and the later provided history was helpful. The plaintiff's lawyer scoffs at the dream of a radiologist getting history. Question, at that time when you initially reviewed it, you did nothing to help this patient, correct? Answer, I was reviewing the cases and it takes a very long time, just like a math problem. It takes a very long time to figure out the answer. When you have the answer, it's very easy, but it really takes a long time to figure out a problem, especially with so much history or limited history. Question, doctor, you're not getting the history. You're a radiologist. Answer, yes. What? Sorry, what's he driving at? That as a radiologist, you shouldn't be given the history or that you shouldn't expect to get the history? I think he's assuming the history is the information obtained from the patient or from the clinicians. You know, oh, you're, you're not actually getting the information firsthand. You're getting a request form, I think, is what he's getting. There at. is this, actually, and I've heard it from physicians as well, where you, know, you shouldn't give your radiologist too much information because you want an unbiased, true read rather than uh, a framed biased read. Mm. And, and I, I had actually had the impression that the lawyer was saying that radiologists just don't get good history and that's the reality you have to live with. And I thought that was an unfortunate commentary on the state of medicine that we practice in. But it might as well mm. be that your other interpretation is right. 
it's a bit hard to know just from the description there, isn't it? Tweet 8, the resident says she did see the Basler tip irregularity and was the first to call attention to it, but the lawyer impeaches her on the semantic difference between irregularity and non-opacification or occlusion. Answer, no, I already saw the irregularity at the Basler tip. Question, this is not an irregularity, this is a non-opacification, irregular reconstitution of flow with P2, P3 and more distal posterior cerebral arteries. That's what I showed you that showed there was an occlusion. Right, doctor? Right, doctor? This is good legal stuff. I've been reading a Lincoln Lawyer novel recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of adversarial tension. Uh, I kind of sensed that when I was reading this transcript, the lawyer was showing the defendant you know, select images and having the, the radiologist kind of point out what they see. Do they see this? Do they see that? You know, now that they're board certified, you know, several years later, would you have called this any differently? Yeah, it was it was very uncomfortable to read. Have the scans been published? Is that something either of you have seen? No, no. I mean, listening to it, it, it sounds like it's not really a true top of basilar, but more like a P one segment mm. occlusion, presumably that interrupted some of the perforators. Because if two residents who work in an emergency department, including a, a, what are they, fourth year, the Mm. the senior one, are umming and ahhing about it. This is not a great big stonking hyperdense basilar, right? Like it might be obvious by the time you've seen the patient and can see that they've got a posterior circulation stroke and maybe, you know, there's a subsequent CT or something that shows a hypodensity or, or whatever, but it's not the kind of obvious finding that as soon as you point it out, mm. everyone agrees. They yeah. ummed and ahed over it. And uh, if a attending had missed it instead, I guess the lawsuit would have had a different flavor and they would have focused on something else perhaps. Mm. But um, I, I guess we all had those situations where you spot a finding, you think, oh, I wonder whether that's something. It's not until you show a couple other people, discuss it around, and eventually you settle on, oh, yeah, that's definitely abnormal right that happens quite often it's quite it's part of the actual process of being a radiologist is that you can't jump to straight away oh yeah that's definitely abnormal you always have to think could this just be a variant is this a real finding yeah from what it's saying between the interaction between those two radiology residents it can't have been the most obvious abnormality in the world So tweet nine, the non-contrast head CT preliminary report is reissued with additional findings called in at 7.35 a.m. Concern for acute infarction of the midbrain correlate with pending MRI. This is addended later in the morning with the finding of a minimal hyperdensity at the basilar tip. So I'll read the actual report. It says impression uh, number one, no evidence of acute intracranial hemorrhage, mass effect or shift of midline structures, stroke code, critical results value discussed with Dr. Redacted with readback verification at 4.15 a.m. Two, small region of parenchymal hypodensity, right parasagittal midline within the midbrain concerning for acute infarction, recommend correlation with MRI of the brain pending at the time of interpretation. This finding was discussed with Dr. Redacted of the neurology team at approximately 7.35 a.m. Three, extensive paranasal sinus disease, as described, correlate for acute sinusitis. And four, subtle hyperdensity at the tip of the basilar artery concerning for thrombus. Burying the lead a little bit there by putting it as number four, but I guess this is addendums to previous reports, so it's often keeping the same structure as maybe the original one and then adding in a fourth finding, I guess. If you can already see a hypodensity in the brainstem on the very first non-contrast CT, that does not bode well no. for the patient, regardless of what was found. By the time you're seeing abnormalities on a non-contrast CT, the chances of having a significant salvageable amount of brain in that territory is pretty low, I would have thought. You're speaking like an expert witness. You just need to be a bit more definitive, Gaylard. <laughs> Get you on the stand. <laughs> and that's exactly what the defense tried to harp on, was that because you could already see a non-contrast CT, the evidence of infarct, it likely had already been present for several hours, and this is a large area of non-salvageable tissue. And so, the other that- thing, can I just point out that I think an impression in a patient who might have a brainstem stroke that includes as one of the four points sinusitis is really unhelpful. It distracts, it dilutes, and it just makes you sound like you don't know what the 
mm. point of the study is. That should be somewhere in the body and left for later. You don't know what was said in the background, though. It sounds like they may have been thinking something to do with infection and encephalitis. So oh, maybe, I see. Maybe a yeah. root of, of infection would be from the sinuses. I suspect that may be why it's still mentioned in there, but I'm just, mm. again, I'm just okay. you know, inferring that, that from, from what I've read. And that's why they did the lumbar puncture. Mm. Yeah. Tweet 10, the head CTA preliminary report is reissued with additional findings communicated at 7.35 a.m. Irregular calibre of the basilar tip and PCA P1 segments. The final report goes a step further to call this irregular non-opacification consistent with thromboembolism. So the addendum reads, irregular calibre of the P1 arteries and basilar tip with reconstitution of the distal portions of the basilar artery Formal characterization MRI can be obtained to further characterize. There's a bit of an error in there, isn't it? Distal portions of the basilar artery, I think, mm-hmm. should be posterior cerebral arteries. And then the the further report, the final report there, CT angiography, circle of Willis, irregular non-opacification of the basilar tip with non-opacification of the proximal posterior cerebral arteries as detailed. These findings are compatible with thromboembolism. There is irregular reconstitution of flow within the P2, P3, and more distal posterior cerebral arteries bilaterally, likely from collateral flow. Posterior communicating arteries are hypoplastic or absent bilaterally. The proximal left superior cerebral artery is also poorly delineated and may be occluded. This critical result value was discussed with Dr. Redacted with readback verification at 7.35 a.m. Readback verification, that means that they're they're saying they acknowledge what you've said to them. Is that what you mean there, Francis? Yeah, it just means they've acknowledged receipt of the message. Uh, so we have to close the loop on these uh, critical results to ensure that they got through to the treating team. We just yeah. can't send a message in the EMR and just sign off the report. Yeah. So can I um, point something out that's certainly true for me, but I'd be interested to know whether you feel the same way. The way that I look at a non-contrast CT brain and CTA performed at the same time, and I'm reporting both of them, is different to when a non-contrast CT has been performed previously, and now I'm just looking at the CTA. I'm much more likely to tie findings together when I'm reading both of them and issuing a combined report than this sort of piecemeal approach. Mm. And that sort of harkens back to the idea of what are they worried about at the beginning? Because if this had been, at least in my institution, if the question had been query stroke, then you would have got a CT, non-contrast CTA and perfusion all at once. And and I reckon the chances of noticing that the hyperdensity correlates with the uh, missing P1 segment, especially because then the images are co-registered and you can easily see which bit is which would be much higher. Do you think that's a just a frankism or do you do you feel yeah. the same way? And it way? looks like this this angiogram was only performed, what, 10 or 15 minutes after the non-contrast CT. So I think they were expecting a bleed, right? So they do it, mm-hmm. they don't see the bleed, and then maybe they go, oh, hang on, we better add on a CTA. But they were reported separately. I would have they? reported them as, yeah, as, as one study. Um, but we'll move on to tweet 11. So the neurovascular service gets the message at 7.45 a.m., Groin puncture is at 8.43 a.m. And it's TICI3 recanalization after the first pass. That's at 8.51 a.m. So this is the notes, I assume, written by the neurointerventionalist. 41-year-old male with no significant past medical history presented as stroke code when found unresponsive. NIH 25 on arrival. Clinical picture complicated by seizures. Neurovascular service called at 7.45 a.m. to evaluate the patient and imaging. Patient currently intubated and found to be unresponsive and quadriplegic, consistent with NIH of 25. CTA reviewed and patient found to have top of basilar occlusion. Patient's condition is life-threatening, large vessel occlusion. We'll take the patient emergently to neurovascular interventional radiology for a mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, So an NIHSS score of 25 on arrival, that's a severe stroke. And, you know, based on that alone, the likelihood of, of disability and death even from this stroke is very, very large, even without the thrombectomy being performed. And I think we haven't even mentioned to this point that back in 2018, thrombectomy was probably not even established as standard of care at that point or Mm. was only just emerging as standard of care. Yeah, it depends on who you ask what was standard of care. Uh, There were some commentators on Twitter who said, I don't 
know any neurodiversity people back in 2018 who would not have taken this for a thrombectomy. But there were certainly others who said, well, I know of cases around that time where these patients were not taken to thrombectomy. So I think it, the standard of care is local um, and mm. variable yeah. uh, across centers. And I think 2018 was also around the time when the rapid software was starting to roll out and perfusion imaging was starting to increase in its role. Obviously, perfusion wasn't wasn't performed. doesn't seem like it was performed here. Uh, we'll move on. So tweet 12, what role did the other doctors play? The neurology resident reviewed the images in the CT scanner control room while on the phone with the radiology resident. She did the best she could, she testifies, but relied on others for interpretation, radiology and the attending neurologist. So question, you said that you looked at the images on a screen in the CT room, a smaller screen than Dr. Radiology Resident 1 had, correct? Answer, yes. Question, can you tell me why it is you didn't notice this occlusion when you looked at it on your smaller screen? Answer, at the time of my training, I did the best I could, and at that time, I did not appreciate it question. And again, I'm just asking you to explain, what do you mean when you say, and I want to use your words, at that point in your training? What do you mean by that? Answer. So it was early on in my training, you know, with what I had learned thus far, I would review the imaging, but I always kind of relied on, at that time, someone with more experience as I was still learning. Hmm. Tweet 13. The neurology resident presented the case to the telestroke neurology attending, who says she could not access the images. Expert witnesses argued whether it was okay for the attending to neither look at the images nor arrange for an attending radiologist or neurologist review. Uh, I'm going to just pick a, a few bits out of what you put in here, Francis. So this firstly is from the expert witness for the telestroke neurologist's defence talking about what radiology is. It says, radiology is a separate medical specialty with specific training in the interpretation of CT and CTA images. The standard of care for a neurologist is that he or she may rely on a radiologist's interpretation of brain imaging to inform management and treatment decisions. As such, the standard of care did not require Dr. Telly Stroke Neurologist to personally review the CT or CTA films after being informed that they had already been interpreted by a radiologist and did not contain any acute findings. Therefore, it was not a departure from standard of care when Dr. Telestroke Neurologist did not personally review the radiology images for the patient after being informed that they did not contain any acute findings and were negative for a stroke. So that's the defence for the neurologist, an expert witness, and now this is the plaintiff's expert witness, the neurology attending departed from good and accepted practice by relying on a second year radiology and neurology residents misinterpretation of Barry's head CT and neck and head CT angiography scans as being normal without any arterial occlusion. These residents were unqualified to render such an assessment. The telestroke neurologist should have known that. Given Barry's stroke code, she should have reviewed the neurovascular imaging herself if unable to view the images remotely, ensured that they were reviewed by an attending physician qualified to interpret such imaging. Her failure to do so caused an over three hour delay in diagnosis and treatment of Barry's stroke. This delay caused significant damage to Barry's brain. And continuing on, Dr. Telestroke Neurologist did not effectively rule out stroke because Dr. Neurology Resident did not confirm the accuracy of the initial interpretation of the CTA and CT head as negative. In the context of all of the circumstances, most importantly the history and the clinical presentation, Dr. Telestroke Neurologist had an affirmative obligation by the way of a question and answer discussion with Dr. Neurology Resident to confirm the CTA and CT head were interpreted by an attending radiologist and on learning that this had not occurred to take steps to have an attending review the studies in a timely manner. So effectively our uh, expert witness here is having it either way. So if the telestroke neurologist knew the scan was interpreted by a second year radiology resident, they should have ensured the images were reviewed by a radiology attending. Or if they didn't know, then they should have questioned the neurology resident to obtain that information. Oh, this is a really interesting point, isn't it? And it's, uh, I mean, one, you can hear everyone scurrying for, for cover. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of understandable because you know something 
bad has happened and you, you have a premonition that things are not going to work out well. But at some point, you need to trust your other teams. Uh, and I think it's, it's fairly uh, onerous to rely on everyone double-checking everyone else's work under every circumstance even though no doubt when that happens, you can avoid misses. Um, but radiologists read the pictures, neurologists examine the patient. It would be the same as saying to a radiologist who was given incorrect information on the request that they had a responsibility to find out who had examined the patient. And if they discovered that it was a junior resident, then they had a responsibility to find a senior person that had examined them or had gone and done it themselves. And again, it's not that it wouldn't work, but it sounds pretty hardcore. Mm. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because there's you can think of so many times where a clinician, non-radiologist, has looked at images and they have found something that is of more significance than maybe you put in mm. your initial report and then you can go, oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'm going to, I'll, I'll make an addendum there. And so you're kind of thankful that they've had a look at it, but then it is ultimately your role as a radiologist to be the person interpreting the images. So you can't really blame them when they fail to look at the images and, to, yeah. and they haven't quite got your back uh, on every case. Tweet 14, a neurosurgery resident was dragged in because the IT metadata showed he looked at the head CT images at 4.19am. He testified that he was asleep and not on call and it must have been someone else using a computer he was logged in on at the hospital. He is dropped from the case. I'm uh, calling that out as as not true. The neurosurgery resident is never asleep at 4am, <laughs> even if you're not on call. <laughs> Tweet 15, the emergency medicine attending said he reviewed the report and not the images. He is not trained to read head CTs and CTAs. He was dismissed from the suit. Question, lab tests reviewed, imaging reviewed. By imaging reviewed, you didn't actually look at the image, correct? You only looked at the report, correct? Answer, only the report, correct? So it seems that basically, if you don't look at the images, you kind of absolve yourself of responsibility for interpreting the images. And the converse is also true that if you're seen looking at images, that the presumption is you know how to look at images and therefore mm. you're responsible for interpreting the images as well. That reminds me of the uh, Good Samaritan sort of clauses of uh, the moment you start to look after someone and try and render help then you become liable for the help mm. that you provide and it creates an incentive to just walk on past. Yeah. This actually also makes me think about the implications for point of care ultrasound because those physicians who are using point of care ultrasound, they're rate really taking responsibility for those images. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily store the images. That makes it easier maybe to hide errors or misinterpretations. Mm -hmm. But that's an interesting area, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, tweet 16 the plaintiff opening statement paints a picture of after hours resident autonomy and computer glitches, which won't surprise anyone in medicine, but to a juror, what kind of place is this? These are your words, Francis. Mm -hmm. So I'll read a little bit from the plaintiff's opening statement. In that hospital, when you have a stroke code like this that's called, you're supposed to have a doctor who is a board certified radiologist reading the CAT scans, a doctor who is qualified, a doctor who has spent years studying this, and to be board certified. What that means is you have four years of residency so that you can become board certified, which is a two-part test. It's a major event, major studying going into this. And then if you wanted to continue to become a neuroradiologist, would be a fellowship for one or two years. You ready for this? The doctor that they had in the hospital who is a radiologist is not a radiologist who's board certified. It's a doctor who is training and it's the only, this is the only radiologist in the hospital. She has been in training, you ready? One and one quarter years. She's not even halfway through her residency. They did not have a board certified radiologist reading this and no one let the patient's wife know that the person who's reading these films is the most inexperienced radiologist in the hospital and the only radiologist in the hospital at that time. Hmm. The patient's wife was never told. She was never told that in fact the most inexperienced doctors were the ones who were treating her husband. She was never told, nor will you see it anywhere in the hospital chart, and we have that, thousands of pages, never will you see anything that's terribly important that Dr. Telly Stroke Neurologist could not get online because of a computer screw-up. 
You're never going to see that. But that's what happened. This is negligence stacked upon negligence, carelessness stacked upon carelessness. These are departures from accepted standards of medical practice, and they prevented him from having a chance at a reasonable life, a substantial chance because of their delays. That's what's happening. I can see the uh, dramatization for the Netflix special. Yeah. Do you think already. they'll call me up and say, Andrew, we want you to play the role <laughs> the of plaintiff's the... lawyer? Mm. <laughs> no. You never know. No. Can't handle the truth. Uh, tweet Perry 17. <laughs> The defence focuses on causation. The miss is conceded, but the damage was done based on imaging and time last known well, and thrombectomy would not have made the demonstrable difference in outcome claimed. Also, it wasn't standard of care in 2018. So I'll read a little bit from the defence opening statement. But the evidence is going to show that the damage was done, that the infarcts or strokes were there and there would not have been a demonstrable difference in the outcomes in terms of what the functioning of Barry would have been like, about whether he could have gone back to work, about whether he could have had relationships with his wife, with his children, and the evidence is going to show that no, he wouldn't have been able to, not because of this delay, but because of the devastating effects of the stroke that he had had. The most important time period is at the beginning when the stroke is happening. You're going to hear evidence about the effectiveness of thrombectomy and you're going to hear that at that time, we've heard the word standards of care, that at that time in the redacted institution name, doing thrombectomies was not even the standard of care. Tweet 18. At this point, the defendants include one, the hospital and its two resident employees in neurology and radiology, and two, the telestroke neurology attending. It comes out that the neurology resident did not call the neurology attending until 5.35 a.m. The plaintiff argues identification of clot and thrombectomy should have occurred before 5.30 a.m., so they decide to drop the neurology attending. The hospital then tries to keep the neurology attending in the case by suing the locums agency, but it was too late and the judge dismisses this. So it's interesting that you've got the the hospital wanting to keep the neurologist on the hook for partial blame. All right, this brings us all to the verdict, Gaylard. So uh, Mm. this was a jury trial. So if you were the judge here, Frank, what questions Mm -hmm. would you put to the jury to answer? This is hard. I can see how this is going to play out. So I'm going to guess the main questions are going to be, was a finding missed that should have been seen? And I'm guessing that the answer here is going to be yes. And if so... Did this occur because just of the failure of the radiology resident or something more systemic, so for the hospital-wide? And and I I have strong reservations about this, but I'm going to guess that based on the transcripts that you've read out, again, the answer is going to be yes. And I suppose it's going to have to be something about the core fact, which is did this miss result in avoidable disability? And... Although the presence of hypodensity in the brainstem to me suggests that it's, there's a good chance that nothing would have really been terribly different, I'm, I'm going to bet that the answer is going to be yes again. You're putting your, your layperson shoes on. Yeah. Um, so tweet 19, this is the verdict. So it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, Francis, that the judge kind of determines or perhaps the defence concedes that there was a departure from good and accepted medical practice in this case. And therefore, the judge asks the jury to decide if that departure, or actually three separate departures, influences the outcome for the patient. And that's what the jury really has to decide. Yeah, I'm not I'm not exactly sure about the process by which the questions posed to the jury get worded, because uh, mm. I, I agree. I think that's a strong assumption to make that there was a departure. But uh, yeah, I, I just don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, because it seems that part is already the, the the jury is not deciding upon that. Perhaps they've decided on that previously, and then once they've decided on that, these are the three subsequent questions. I don't know, but um, anyway, we'll we'll continue on. So number one, this is the first question for the jury: Was the departure from good and accepted medical practice by the hospital neurology resident and radiology resident in misinterpreting the patient's CTA a substantial factor in depriving him of a substantial chance for a better outcome? And the jury answer is yes. Next tweet, and this is the second question, was the departure from good and accepted medical practice by the hospital in failing to have an experienced radiologist timely interpret the patient's CTA as a substantial factor in depriving him of a substantial chance for a better outcome? 
And the jury's answer is yes. That's an interesting one. Mm. And tweet 21, so this is the third question. Was the departure from good and accepted medical practice by the neurology resident in failing to timely contact the neurology attending about the patient's care and treatment a substantial factor in depriving him of a substantial chance for a better outcome? Jury answer is yes. So yes to all three. We'll do the damages now and then we'll we'll move on to discuss things in more detail. So the damages for past and future pain and suffering, they awarded $9 million plus $42 million for future. The past and future medical care, $550,000 and then $34.6 million for future medical care. Past and future damages sustained by his wife for loss of services and society, $9.4 million plus $41.6 million and the total is $137 million. US dollars. That's a lot of money. And Francis, you finish up with tweet 23 and you're asking your Twitter audience a question. You say, what do you think? Do we need more assurances of radiology resident competency for critical diagnosis before call? Do we need around the clock radiology attending or neurology or neurointerventional attending image review for all code strokes? And that's the end of the, the tweets. What do you think, Gaylord? Oh my God, I have so much to say about this, but I, I don't really have them all in in any kind of order. But the first and probably most important idea that I keep circling back to, not just because of this discussion, but generally, is the way that we frame questions as yes or no. In this case, you know, did they miss this? Did um, they miss the opportunity to affect outcome, et cetera? And I think this yes or no way of framing questions is really unhelpful. And because almost all questions in life in general are not yes, no questions, they're or questions. And the reason there's an or in there is because the answer has implications. And so in this case, the question, should this finding have been identified earlier? The answer is of course, yes. You know, it should have been, and if it was you, you would have wanted it to be identified earlier. And if you're the radiologist, you would have wished that it had been identified earlier. But if you change that question to an or question, it becomes much more interesting. So the question would then read something like, um, do we accept occasional misses like this, or do we require 24 hour a day consultant or attending review for every case? And the moment you frame the question like that, it's a much harder question to answer because what that captures is it's not just wishful thinking of would it have been nice for this to be identified, but what would it take from a organizational point of view to avoid this kind of miss? And are we willing to expend the resources to achieve that? Bearing in mind that the central problem in modern medical practice is how do we resolve the conflict between an essentially unlimited appetite for healthcare versus a very much limited resource Hmm. allocation. And so obviously this is a horrible thing that happened to this person and obviously we wish it didn't. And you could say that if the study had been triple read by board certified subspecialty neuroradiologists, this mistake wouldn't have happened. But if you did that, the health system would collapse immediately because we don't have the resources to do that. So I worry about this kind of um, judgment as to what flow on effects it will have in terms of call requirements, recruiting, retention, um, shift work, etc. To me, that's kind of the central thing that worries me. What do you think? That makes a lot of sense, Frank. And a lot of the commentary on Twitter was about how you can't make organizational decisions based off of a malpractice case that you have to consider the uh, larger consequences if you make a policy change like requiring 24-7 attending coverage, right? Um, And some of the considerations you'd have to take into account is misses like these are not a never event. They do occur on occasion and even by board certified radiologists even by neuroradiologists on a rare occasion. And what has been justifying the continued existence of programs out there that have a solo radiology resident coverage overnight is that their miss rate that is of clinical importance is about as low as that of general radiologists out there in the community 
practicing. Uh, and, you know, if they get overread by another radiologist, that would be their miss rate as well. So from that perspective, uh, I think if you continue, uh, if you consider the aggregate data, uh, these residents in this specific situation are, are doing well uh, when considering aggregate. And unfortunately, that doesn't play out well in malpractice cases because you're considering one patient and the harm that resulted to this one patient. It's that, you know, what is medical standard of care or reasonable human error when you're designing a health system and allocating your resources, so your, your nighttime staffing, for instance, it's something that we understand as medical practitioners, but the standard that a jury of lay people expect when you ask them these questions is, you know, almost perfection at all times, 24-7, right? And that dichotomy, I think, is very hard to resolve and probably never will be resolved. Thinking about the Australian context for this, we have in Australia a thing called the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which means that anybody who sustains a disability or is born with a disability, they're all covered for care finances. This really helps, I think, in Australia to kind of reduce the amount of this kind of litigation that occurs mm -hmm. because they kind of, you know, if, if this does happen to a patient, there is a support net there for them. They're not going to be left behind. And I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, Francis, that in the US, you have those people where they can pr prove that there was negligence and therefore they get this massive sum of money awarded by the courts. And then there's those who can't prove it and therefore they have to pay for everything themselves and it's going to be a lifelong struggle. Whereas in Australia, I, th I feel like we've got that system where we're really supporting people. It's much, much fairer. And that leads to less of this litigation, less of these kind of decisions, and then hopefully less defensive reporting in our health system and radiologists able to accept that there are errors and accept that we do need to staff, you know, night times without multiple experts being able to read the scan. One thing, Andrew, that I think is really important, and, and you say that we understand it in the medical area, this idea that we're not perfect reading or abnormality identifying machines. I think we recognize that for subtle abnormalities, but I think even within medicine, there's this feeling that if an abnormality is obvious, when it gets missed, you kind of shake your head and think, how could that be missed? I would never miss that. You have this feeling, right? If I showed you a, a CT brain with a two centimeter hemorrhage, say, or a metastasis or something, like a really obvious finding, and I told you that one of your colleagues had not seen it, part of you would be like, oh, they must have, mm, you know, what were they doing? Were they not paying attention? There's a, there's a bit of a judgment there. Even though we know humans are not perfect detection machines, even for big abnormalities. And there's those famous gorilla studies, you know, the mm. man in the gorilla suit that walks through while people dressed in white throw basketballs yeah. and you're asked to count, right? And th that's as obvious a finding as you're going to get. And yet that gets missed. And I've had some misses that fortunately haven't come to any harm where I go back to the study and I genuinely have no idea how I could not have perceived this abnormality because it's so obvious. And I remember when I was a resident, one of my attendings on a CTA of the liver missed a 12 centimeter FNA that was enhancing like a kidney in the middle of the liver. And I remember thinking as a trainee, oh my God, they're terrible, you know, how lax, et cetera. And now with many misses under my belt, I just realized that we're imperfect. And so when you have a, a really obvious miss and you only present that one case and you draw an arrow to it, and even the jurors can see it, the strong feeling is that there must have been negligence for missing it. That's just a, a lack of understanding how our terribly imperfect monkey brains work. Long live AI and robots. <laughs> and that's without even little errors like saying FNA when you meant to say FNH. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that too. <laughs> Sorry, could, couldn't let it slide, mate. I just want to finish with maybe two questions for you, Francis, to bring this home. So what should we as radiologists, do you think, be taking away from this $130 million malpractice case? And I guess like it or not, what do you actually think that radiologists slash physicians slash hospitals, what do you think they'll take away from this malpractice decision? I think it's easy to fall in the trap of changing your practice to be more defensive to avoid malpractice cases like this. But I think there are a couple of reasons why 
you shouldn't practice in fear of malpractice. Uh, in the U.S., uh, it's generally true that your personal assets are not really at risk. Many physicians get sued, but they're not you know, kicked out of the profession. What's at stake is really just the psychological distress that you have to go through being interrogated by the plaintiff lawyer. Uh, but for the most part, these are well-intentioned, uh, otherwise competent physicians, right? These are not Dr. Death radiologists. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really not an event to uh, live your entire career trying to avoid. And so uh, at the end of the day, I think people should focus on doing their best to take care of the patient, not strewing hedge words uh, throughout your report to avoid any chance of you know, malpractice claim against you, because I don't think that really affects that uh, possibility. And I think it just degrades the uh, uh, quality of your reports. I like that, Francis, and I think that is what radiologists should really take away from this case. But what do you think will actually happen from a hospital system point of view? I think some hospitals will be uh, taking a look at that very large jury award amount and be scared and uh, may be pushing towards changing uh, overnight staffing to have uh, attending coverage. Uh, overnight. It might not be the hospital's choice either, because presumably hospitals are insured for this sort of thing. Yeah. And it may well be insurance companies that make these requests as the basis for insurance. Yeah. Mm. That's a good point. I'm speaking with no understanding of how <laughs> insurance works, but I guess that it's not that hospitals pay yeah. just have a kitty for, for this kind of cost. And it could be um, pressure from multiple sources. It could be from the emergency physicians who will fear that they're at high risk of liability, or it could be the neurologists who fear that the attending, the telestroke neurologist has to accept all the liability for interpreting these images overnight as well. Um, and, and so it can come from a various uh, number of sources. But on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned before, I think uh, as long as you have good data showing the the major miss rate of residents doing these emergency radiology interpretations overnight is low and comparable to that of um, you know general radiologists elsewhere that is still a defensible practice. Uh, I think the really sad thing is that if there is a reactive change to practices, and I'm not speaking from a quality of life for radiologists point of view, but just from a quality of healthcare for all the other patients, that the net result could well be that the standard of care drops rather than increases because you displace resources to reduce an already uncommon miss. But those resources have to come from somewhere. And also from a recruiting point of view, the less attractive you make a profession, the less people go into it. And if it becomes known that neuroradiologists have to be doing shift work, then some people that would otherwise go into neuroradiology won't and they'll Mm. pick another profession. Uh, And those are much harder to ever quantify. You'll never have a trial and there'll never be an award for people who don't become neuroradiologists. And and these things distort the provision of healthcare in invisible ways and add to the complexity and mismatch of resources to the problem. And the final thing I wanted to mention with regards to radiology residents or registrars being on call overnight and reporting these scans, particularly if they're junior, not being afraid to actually call up the radiologist who's on call. I assume in the US there would have been an on-call radiologist who would have been available to take a call and maybe review the images. And a lot of the residents and registrars here feel like they really don't want to interrupt the sleep of the consultant radiologist. And so they're not going to call up, even if they're looking at this and going, oh, there's a bit of a regularity here. They wait for the 7am other registrar or resident to arrive rather than going, look, I think I do need to to call up the radiologist. So I just want to give support to trainees out there that if you're on your own at night and you see something and you think it might be significant, but you're not sure, and, and it's a critical situation here where you've got an unconscious patient, I think that is the moment to feel that you can wake up the radiologist, Absolutely. give them a call, and they're not going to yell at you for calling you about a basal tip thrombosis didn't come up in this case at all, the idea of the on-call radiologist. I guess that's because this resident didn't contact them overnight. And if there's one thing that come out of this, I think it's don't be afraid to, to call your supervising consultant anytime. And the reality is that the number of cases that are genuinely time critical, where a couple of hours will make a significant difference to patient are actually quite uncommon. Hmm. 
So we're not opening the floodgates to 20 calls a night. This is not about the kidney stone. Is it a kidney stone or is it a phlebolith in the pelvis? Top of basal possible occlusion in an unconscious patient, that's no one will ever get upset about being called about that or no one should. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, we better wrap this up. It's been a very fascinating discussion, a long episode, but absolutely fascinating. And thank you, Francis, for not only bringing this to our attention through your Twitter threads, but also coming on the podcast. Frank, how can people get in contact with us? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter, X, and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. Although I should mention, I don't check Twitter very much, so if you're writing to <laughs> well, let's, me... Well, let's change that to at Francis Ding on Twitter. Yes, that's right. They can all be <laughs> redirected. Uh, but you can email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and or feedback, including about this episode. And Vikas Shah asked me to mention that Radiopedia also has a presence on the Threads platform. So that's the relatively new meta platform similar to X. So if you are a Threads user, then please uh, give us a follow over there too. And if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all access pass to our online courses and conference. And in doing so, you'll be helping us give free conference access to people in 125 low and middle income countries. Yes. And Francis, you are one of the conveners for Radiopedia 2024, which is coming up in July. Registrations are open. Everyone should register. Uh, how's the program shaping up, Francis? The program is looking awesome. We have a lot of great speakers and they're talking about awesome stuff. People can check out the program for themselves and who's speaking uh, right now. You didn't invite that Frank Gaylord guy, did you? <laughs> we, we might have. <laughs> we might have. Oh, oh no. Uh, <laughs> yes, you'll see plenty of Frank, you'll see plenty of me, and you'll see plenty of Francis as well. And don't forget that for the first time, our conference will be AMA, PRA, Category 1. I'm laughing credits, because you're supposed to do this open in bracket, Italian S, accent. Close brackets, TM, all in italics, <laughs> accredited. <laughs> and, and what else can people do to help us out, Frank? And you can also help out by leaving us a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Excellent. Thank you, Francis, once again for joining us for this episode. Thank you, Frank. And we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay right, everyone. Stay right. You can't handle the rad. <laughs> That's very good. I was going to go with a law and order. Chunk, chunk at the end. <laughs> all right. See you in a couple of weeks, Frank. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.